discussing the role that Disneyland, the famous theme park in Anaheim, California, has played in providing guests with comfort, entertainment, and education since its opening day in 1955. And some of the themes I will explore today will correspond with many of the concepts that the Palmer Museum's 50th anniversary exhib exhibition is taking on, uh, including history, which Patrick just mentioned. So Disneyland uses design elements, sounds, food, and attractions to really transport guests to different time periods. At Disneyland, representations of the past tend to avoid the messier parts and privilege, positivity, heroism, and uplift instead. And it's this distortion of the past that I think explains why a lot of professional historians tend to grimace or scrunch their noses or scowl when they think of Disneyland. So professional historians, at least the folks I've interacted with as an academic, they don't have the best relationship with the Disney brand. And that's because manipulated history that avoids a lot of the complexity that historians are so committed to um, is really critical to creating Disneyland's fun, entertaining, and consumer-focused atmosphere. History has been essential to making Disneyland the place, but Disneyland has also been a place made by history. If we go back to the 1950s when Disneyland was being planned and constructed, it became clear that Disneyland the place is a product of the major forces underway, namely suburban expansion, highway construction, and Cold War anxieties. In addition, Disneyland, as well as Disney's California Adventure Park, which is built just across the way from Disneyland, have both over time come to represent some of the places that its design and construction were based on. In some cases, those original places have actually been destroyed or at least seriously neglected, so the Disney version is sort of the best we have. In other cases, those original places do exist, but to many, the Disney versions now are more real, more tangible, more accessible, and even preferred to the original. I want to also discuss this concept of community with all of you tonight. Now, as a corporation, Disney is typically, typically equated with conservatism and a pro-free enterprise ethos. But I would like to discuss the wider range of communities that, once they establish a connection with the brand, have in fact pushed it to be more equitable and more inclusive. I think Disneyland's cast member cohort is one example. There's a very strong tradition of Disneyland employees banding together to demand a living wage, better health care, and less restrictive dress codes. And as we will see, vocal fans of Disneyland have also been a powerful force in shaping what kinds of behaviors and representations are permitted at the park. As a result, we see them essentially directly participating in determining the values that the corporation embodies. And they also have a role in charting the course for the company's future. Disneyland has always been in the business of trying to predict the future. There is a reason one of the park's centerpieces is called Tomorrowland. Now, this section of the park has primarily been utilized as an advertising opportunity for corporations and also a way to highlight the futuristic intellectual property, Star Wars, Buzz Lightyear, that Disney owns. But it has also been leveraged to offer optimistic predictions about technological innovations and signal, signal the superiority of American capitalism. But future does not just apply to the land of tomorrow in the park. Future also speaks to the intent of Disneyland to educate, perhaps others would use the word indoctrinate, future generations of American citizens and also visitors from all over the world. In these respects, Disneyland at once predicts and shapes the future. So uh, my talk actually won't be segmented into these particular themes, but I will offer examples of how they kind of work together to infuse the Disney park experience. 
What I thought I'd do first is actually take us back to the 1950s, to Disneyland's development and construction in Southern California, which was fundamentally shaped by the post-World War II economic boom. Huge federal government expenditures during the war brought the U.S. economy out of the Great Depression. And for Southern California, more specifically, wartime spending greatly enriched the area. The government injected $35 billion into the state by 1945. Not much later, uh, Congress's GI Bill would fund education and home ownership for returning veterans. Later on, President Dwight D. Eisenhower helped launch a massive federal construction project when he passed the Federal Highway Act of 1956. The result was this impressive interstate highway system funded largely by federal gasoline taxes. Now, the purpose of these highways was to serve the needs of defense, also commerce, but to really just improve the standard of living for everyday Americans. The interstate highway system is something that inspired what historians refer to as the second great age of the automobile. Now, federal investment and car culture was going to do quite a bit to shape Southern California and Disneyland's construction at mid-century. When it came to deciding where to locate his planned Mickey Mouse Park, as Walt Disney originally referred to it, he sought out the help of the Stanford Research Institute, which performed research and development projects for the government and also for private companies. Now, Anaheim was selected as the location for the park ultimately, in part because it was located right alongside the projected route of the Santa Ana Freeway coming out of Los Angeles. Walt Disney figured that the freeway would accelerate residential growth in the area, and by golly, he was right. The freeway ultimately put Disneyland right in the middle of suburban expansion. Much of the early marketing for the park emphasized how easy it would be to drive and park your car there. And Disneyland benefited directly from Eisenhower's highway project. The highway intersecting with Disneyland was incorporated into the federal highway network as part of Interstate 5, which generated even more traffic for Disneyland. Now, car culture seeped into Disneyland in other ways too. The uh, attraction on the screen here, that is Autopia. It was one of the most popular attractions at the park from the time it opened. And look at that um, rider he, uh, behind the wheel looking very excited and very intently at the road. Um, according to Walt Disney, this ride actually had educational value. Disney explained how the miniature gasoline-powered cars would teach children how to drive safely on the rapidly growing uh, highway system. So in general, we see Disneyland's success in 1955 was going to be heavily dependent on car culture and highway infrastructure. There are some other forces shaping Disneyland's design that I'll speak to here. In large part because of government spending, the 1950s were characterized by affluence. They were also characterized by anxiety. Historians have found Americans had anxiety about nuclear war, anxiety about American involvement in conflicts abroad, and also anxiety about the spread of communism. There's also anxiety about the civil rights movement and the very real segregation, economic marginalization, and other forms of racist inequality and violence that civil rights leaders and activists were bringing attention to. All of that is to say, and this is something that I try to impress upon my students, there were plenty of divisions in American society in the 1950s. And those things are going to explain why the themes of safety and control were so prominent at Disneyland. And that was very intentional. One of the reasons Disneyland was so new and exciting in 1955 is because it was clean and cohesive. This was seen as a very radical departure from the congestion and more adult-like atmosphere and cheap thrills that tended to characterize other amusement parks like Coney Island in New York, for example. Disneyland, on the other hand, would be about distancing people from the challenges and tensions 
anxieties is the word I've been using, uh, that, that really embedded and infused the outside world. So when you go to Disneyland, there's no poverty, there's no civil rights protests, there's no threat of the Soviet Union. Instead, you have a very predictable environment where everyone is getting along and where everything is reassuring and safe. So let's take Main Street USA as an example, the image um, you'll see on the screen on your left. So this is going to be the first themed area that you encounter when you walk into Disneyland. And you, when you go there, you'll find nice cobbled walkways and clip clopping horses. Those are all meant to recreate an idealized version of small town America at the turn of the 20th century. Now, not just Main Street, but the other themed areas in the park, they essentially operate as movie sets that park goers get a chance to directly participate in. Disneyland's connection to the movie business is, of course, going to make this possible. Remember, folks, this is Southern California, the capital of the American film industry. Movie studio art directors design Disneyland as a set of themed environments or scenes that are working seamlessly together. Advanced systems of circulation throughout the park are going to keep crowds headed in the right direction. And I think one of the best ways to get this sense of a carefully cultivated movie-esque environment is from how people talked about Disneyland and its employees right at the beginning. The park itself was often referred to as the show, and its employees were reminded constantly that they were in show business. Even today, employees are called cast members and customers are referred to as the audience. During Disneyland's development, Marty Sklar, he was the one responsible for the park's marketing materials, he was instrumental to this new vocabulary. More specifically, he tried to eliminate the word ride and replace it with terms like adventures, experiences, or stories instead. What I'd like to do now is explore some of those themed environments in more detail and comment on the role of history in Disneyland storytelling. What made Disneyland different and marked it actually as a theme park as opposed to just an amusement park was its ability to transport guests to different times and places, some far off, others much closer to home. As the park has grown and evolved over the last several decades, I would say this mission has remained the same. Today's guests at Disneyland can walk through dioramas of the Pacific Islands, Asia, and Africa in Adventureland, the legendary Wild West of the 19th century at Frontierland, and the streets of the French Quarter in New Orleans in the mid-19th century, all on the same day, it's fabulous. Now, in these spaces, visitors encounter curated versions of the past that are intended to keep them entertained for as long as possible. Disneyland's themed environments are an, essentially an activity all on their own. Your surroundings are a visual and auditory feast to be enjoyed while literally eating a meal, or perhaps buying a souvenir or waiting in line for attractions. In these spaces, it's important that the outside does not creep in too much. Anything difficult or unpleasant or controversial is going to be taken out to ensure that visitors are not just having fun, but also staying there as long as possible and spending money. For Disneyland's designers, history essentially operates as an extractive industry. So symbols are picked out of the past, ones that are going to make you feel adventurous, brave, heroic, exotic, or maybe just warm and fuzzy. And for some, Disney's manufactured versions are an improvement on the real. And I think Walt Disney's comments from the day that New Orleans Square opened are illustrative of this. So New Orleans Square, the one pictured on the screen, is open to the public at Disneyland on July 24th, 1966. That day, Walt Disney hosted a ceremony with then New Orleans Mayor Victor Shiro. 
And in his remarks, Disney joked to the mayor that his version of New Orleans was much cleaner. He also made the joke that his version cost more to build than the Louisiana Purchase, which of course secured New Orleans and an incredible, incredible amount of acreage uh, for the growing United States. Disney themed environments can sometimes make you feel a bit scared, but in a good way. So since we uh, just passed through Halloween, I thought it appropriate to illustrate this point about history at Disneyland using this iconic attraction. Now, this, of course, is the exterior of the Haunted Mansion, iconic, described by Disney's promotional materials as, quote, a spooky tour through a house of happy, happy haunts. So now you might not know that the Haunted Mansion was not one of the attractions available to guests when the park opened in 1955. Ideas for a New Orleans themed area with its own major anchor attraction were present from the beginning, but the Haunted Mansion is ultimately not going to officially open until 1969, and that was after, as I just mentioned, New Orleans Square was completed. So what I'd like to bring onto the screen now is the Shipley LeDecker house. When Disney Imagineers started planning in New Orleans Square, they did library research and actually traveled to the American South to seek out local legends and ghost stories and architectural examples. Now, uh, historians, bloggers, and official Disney histories all point to the Shipley LeDecker house as the most direct model for the Haunted Mansion's exterior. This building was constructed in Baltimore, Maryland in 1803, and the three-story house, which is accentuated by wrought iron porch railings and large pillars, emerged in the early 19th century during what historians refer to as the Greek Revival Architectural Movement, which spanned the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Now, in both urban and rural settings, Americans ornamented residences, schoolhouses, and government buildings, including the White House and the U.S. Capitol, with columns, pediments, and porticos that looked a lot like the Athenian Acropolis and other ancient structures. Now, interestingly, Greek revival is going to become particularly pop popular among slave owners in the U.S. South. Now, there's not essentially a consensus among architectural historians about why. Some argue that slave owners adorned their plantation houses this way to justify slavery as an honorable, desirable, and fair institution stretching all the way back to ancient Greece. Other scholars suggest that plantation owners adopted Greek revival, not necessarily to make a political point, but because they wanted to be understood as having fashionable tastes. So they wanted to impress people with their elegance and sophistication and prestige. Um, I think it seems likely that uh, multiple factors were at play here when it comes to Greek revival's popularity. For another example, if you will allow it, I'll step just slightly outside of our Disneyland contours here and hop on over to Disney's California Adventure Park. Now, uh, this um, park opened just across the way from Disneyland in 2001. I actually, um, as a young kid, happened to be there on opening day, um, mostly by accident. My parents uh, weren't really aware uh, that we were going to be there on the actual day that the park admitted vis ad admitted visitors, and it was a really interesting experience. Um, I have a different relationship to Disneyland uh, now than I used to, but uh, for those of you who haven't had a chance to visit California Adventure, this park is essentially designed to introduce audiences to California's diverse flavors and personalities. So that would include, for example, the famous piers of Southern California, the star-studded streets of Hollywood, the wharves of the Bay Area, and also the tremendous redwoods and rapids of the Northern region. The park has changed quite a lot in recent years, in part to feature beloved characters from the Pixar films and also to make room for Disney's acquisition of Marvel, which is very valuable intellectual pro property. But there have been some interesting stylistic adjust adjustments that I'd like to bring your attention to. So 
What you see here on the screen is the original entry gate for California Adventure, which featured larger than life letters spelling out California, as well as a replica of the Golden Gate Bridge and a massive ceramic mural with scenes of Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Diego, Monterey. It's really, really something and the detail is very impressive. Now, this imagery replicates what you might see on a postcard telling a family member, wish you were here or greetings from the Golden State. Now, what happened in around 2007 was a major redesign of California Adventure as part of CEO Bob Iger's plan to essentially reinvest in the theme parks. So this redesign cost an estimated $1.1 billion dollars. It also included a brand new entrance for California Adventure. The new entryway mimics the design of the Pan Pacific Auditorium, which is, was a 100,000 square foot venue built in Los Angeles in the 1930s. Over several decades, that space hosted many notable performances and celebrities, including the Ice Capades, the Harlem Globetrotters, Elvis Presley, and President Dwight Eisenhower. Now, the four teal towers and white flagpoles above the Disney turnstiles also offer us a window into the rich history of the Art Deco movement, which had a worldwide impact in the mid-20th century. Now, interestingly, the phrase Art Deco doesn't get invented until the 1960s. People living in the 20s and 30s used other labels like modernistic or zigzag to describe what they were seeing. But um, this terminology to describe Art Deco is really going to speak to the major transformations that occurred between the two world wars. Innovations in lighting and transmission made electricity much cheaper and much more widely accessible. Automobiles, steamships, the transatlantic phone service, radio towers, and other inventions are going to allow people to quickly connect with one another, even when separated by very large distances. Many people living in the 20s and 30s felt like they had entered a truly modern industrial age where life simply moved at a faster pace than it did before. And those feelings are going to be produced in the characteristics that we associate with Art Deco, inclu including, you know, kind of the hard angles, um, which remind me of a bolt of electricity. Um, also the use of gold and silver, really brilliant colors. But uh, there's one other thing at work here, actually, when it comes to the Pan Pacific Auditorium, which is pictured here on the screen, that uh, explains that turnstile design that we ultimately get at, at uh, California Adventure. So there's, for those who don't know, a worldwide economic depression that hits in the late 1920s, and it leads to a really serious re-examination of art and design. The elaborate ornamentation that is typical of Art Deco really to a lot of people didn't make a lot of sense during this period of economic uncertainty and it could, have, it could be perceived as sort of garish, right? So in the United States, this, this, this um, trend of Streamline Modern becomes more prevalent. So Art Deco and Streamline Modern are gonna share a lot of characteristics, but Streamline Modern is going to utilize more inexpensive, easily replaceable materials. That would be things like white cement, stucco, glass brick, and linoleum floors. Now, the 1930s is also the heyday of the transatlantic ocean liner. So many of the motels, bus terminals, gas stations, and event venues, including the Pan Pacific Auditorium, are built with ship-like details like metal railings and portholes. Now, the Pan Pacific Auditorium no longer exists. It closed after the Los Angeles Convention Center opened in the 1970s. Uh, unfortunately, a fire got to it in the 1980s and bulldozers eventually took it down in 1992. But this iconic attraction, excuse me, this iconic structure is going to live on not only at the entrance to Disney's California Adventure Park, but also Disney's Hollywood Studios in Orlando, Florida. Now, 
In some cases, the origins of Disney representations are pretty clear. In others, they are less readily identifiable, at least to the guests who are participating in them. And I will hop back over to Disneyland to Splash Mountain specifically to explore that idea. Now, Splash Mountain, as you can see from the image, is a log flume ride that, as you cannot see from the image, follows the attempts of three critters, Br'er Bear, Br'er Fox, and Br'er Rabbit. Um, and the bear and the fox are doing all they can to capture that darn rabbit. Now, interestingly, by the time Splash Mountain opened at Disneyland, and that was in July of 1989, many Splash Mountain riders actually did not know who the Br'er Critters who, who were populating the, the internal uh, spaces of that log flume ride were. And, and if you read newspaper coverage from that day, I mean, there were journalists very interested in this new attraction and they're interviewing riders and they're saying, I don't know who those critters are, but that drop was amazing. Um, now, they certainly enjoyed, again, the big drop at the end that is pictured here, as well as the whimsical music and the animatronic animals, but they were not familiar with how those characters came out of Disney's infamous film, Song of the South. Now, to tell the story of the Song of the South and Splash Mountain, we actually have to go back to the 1860s. So that is when journalists Joel Chandler Harris was working as a printer on the Turnwald Plantation in Georgia. While there, he started collecting folk tales from the enslaved men and women who labored on the plantation. Now, the composition of these stories is really interesting. They're going to reflect the long-term impacts of the transatlantic slave trade and that they combined African, Caribbean, and American influences all together. So Harris went on to publish these stories in a book titled Uncle Remus, His Songs and Sayings in 1880, and he would use this material again in other books throughout his career. Now, in the late 1930s, the Disney company negotiated with the Harris family for the film rights to the Uncle Remus stories, and that is going to be what the 1946 film Song of the South is based on. Now, Song of the South tells the story of a white woman named Sally and her son, Johnny, who go to stay with Sally's mother on her plantation in post-Civil War Georgia. During his visit, Johnny befriends Uncle Remus, pictured here, played by James Basquette, and he lives and works on the plantation. Uncle Remus offers Johnny a series of life lessons, which Song of the South brings to life with animated sequences that feature Br'er Bear, Br'er Fox, and Br'er Rabbit. Now, despite its inventive use of color and technology, Song of the South did not get quite the positive reception that Disney hoped for when it came out. Now, in 1948, the classic Zippity Doodah would win the Academy Award for Best Original Song, and Basquette would become the first Black man to win an honorary Academy Award for his performance. But Song of the South did not do that well at the box office. And the film's representations of Black people and plantation life also attracted quite a bit of controversy. Now, Disney had intended to capitalize on the success of that blockbuster film, Gone with the Wind, released in 1939, and Song of the South was supposed to be his own movie about the quote-unquote Old South. Now, early 20th century Hollywood films about the South, both before and after the Civil War, often depicted plantations as essentially utopian paradises populated by benevolent white enslavers and happy, submissive Black people. And those things would sort of linger on even when they're representing the post-Civil War era, um, when enslavers are no longer officially enslavers, they are employers. Now, these tropes would obscure a very unsavory reality as historians have shown in which men and women experienced horrific brutality on Southern plantations and were constantly engaging in acts of subtle um, and not so subtle resistance in response to that. Now, by the time Song of the South's debut 
uh, comes along in the 1940s, images of pleasant plantations and loyal Black workers were unsavory to lots of people. Uh, the NAACP actually boycotted Song of the South when it came out. Uh, but when Splash Mountain was opened in the 1980s, the lovable animals from Song of the South were brought to life again. So there inside, you, while riding in your log, would essentially follow the antics of Br'er Fox, Br'er Bear, and Br'er Rabbit. So as you'll see here, actually, some of the gags used in the ride directly replicated what Joel Chandler Harris originally included in his Uncle Remus book from the 1880s. So here on the screen, you'll see we have Br'er Bear strung up by the trap. Uh, that was designed to capture Br'er Rabbit, but Disney's relationship really has never been easy with Song of the South. Uh, years ago, Disney stopped re-releasing the film in theaters or circul circulating it on VHS. More recently, some of you might know, the corporation announced that the Splash Mountain ride would be undergoing a major redesign. The reopened version in 2024 will center around Tiana, Disney's very first Black princess, who appeared in the animated film Princess and the Frog in 2009. And this makes sense. I, I mean, consider that Princess and the Frog is set in New Orleans in the 1920s, and Splash Mountain is roughly adjacent to the Haunted Mansion and New Orleans Square at Disneyland. So we can view this attempt from Disney in a lot of ways, this retheming project. So perhaps it's a way to enlarge or at least maintain Disneyland's consumer base by being relevant to a new generation. We could also see the park maybe responding to grassroots pressures to retheme the ride in order to, in the words of one change.org petition, which I've screenshotted here, reject, quote, extremely problematic and stereotypical racist tropes from the 1946 film Song of the South, end quote. And I would say that that petition campaign is just one example of how, as Disneyland tries to insulate guests from the outside world, Disneyland can't always keep politics out. In fact, on many occasions, Disneyland has become a site of political action. Fans and cast members have come together to push the brand to be something different, something better. Now, that was true before Disneyland in 1941, when Disney animators went on strike for better pay and working conditions. But when it comes to Disneyland specifically, we have other examples of groups using the space to make a point about one political issue or another. In 1970, members of the Youth International Party, also described as the Yippies, gathered at Disneyland to proclaim their opposition to the Vietnam War. More recently, in 2018, beneficiaries of the DACA program and their allies blocked buses from entering the theme park to pressure legislatures, legislators to protect undocumented youth from deportation. And cast members' efforts are ongoing to make real changes to their working conditions in terms of hours and pay, as I mentioned earlier, but also in terms of dress codes. So in 2021, Disney updated their dress code policies to allow for small tattoos, as well as a wider range of hairstyles, jewelry, nails, costume choices. And the aim, according to the company, was to provide better flexibility for employees to display their religious and cultural and also gender identities. Disney said, quote, we're updating them to not only remain relevant in today's workplace, but also enable our cast members to better express their individuality at work. So in interesting and surprising ways, I think the Disney brand can become the source of solidarity. Groups have used Disney's classic language of happiness and of dreams coming true to hold up a mirror and ask the park, but also the corporation more generally, to do better. And I think it makes sense to do that, to actually use the Disney park as a venue to try and reshape the future. By this point, the parks have really become a hallmark of middle-class prosperity, perhaps said another way, the good life, 
and also a symbol of the American dream as embodied by Walt Disney himself, who really did go from no one to the one. As a result, when the political landscape or the company itself falls short on their promises of dreams and happiness, people can then transform the parks into a place to take a stand. And because Disney as a corporation is so large, so pervasive, and so powerful, turning that ship could help encourage more equitable workplace and representation practices elsewhere. And this is something that animators realized in 1941 when it came to taking on um, Disney and, and trying to unionize. Basically, if we can turn that ship, then the jig is up, okay? Now, with all of these things, of course, there has been backlash. The story really doesn't end there. A wide range of employees and consumers feel attached to the parks, as evidenced by the backlash that always comes with changes to the space and to any park-related corporate policy. So critics will claim that they are actually the true owners of the Disney experience and that any agenda uh, excuse me, any updates are simply a response to an overly, quote unquote, woke consciousness that is diametrically opposed to the park ethos or to what Walt would have wanted. And I wanted to give you a few examples of this. Take the announcement that alcohol was going to be sold in, at Galaxy's Edge in Disneyland. So Galaxy's Edge is a Star Wars themed area that opened at Disneyland in January 2020. And it's the only place inside of Disneyland proper, of course, aside from the swanky membership only VIP Club 33 that sells alcohol to park guests. So the fact that Oga's Cantina, pictured here, would offer alcoholic beverages was really big news. Because before that point, Disneyland had maintained a strict dry policy that came from Walt Disney and himself. He's quoted at one point as saying, quote, no liquor, no beer, nothing, because that brings in a rowdy element, end quote. Now, this change provoked lots of responses in the form of op-eds, blog posts, social media comments, uh, and many of those are going to fall into the category of rationalizing why alcohol should not be allowed at Disneyland, because as you'll see from a snapshot from one blog post, alcohol would threaten the character of the Disney parks, right? It's for children. Alcohol causes people to get drunk. Yes, that does happen. Uh, and, and again, as I mentioned, Walt wouldn't have wanted that. Okay, so that's the language that we see in response. Now, the change to Splash Mountain I mentioned earlier prompted its own flurry of conversations online. In fact, another set of competing petitioners demanded that Splash Mountain remain the same. So I will quote the petition pictured here. It is absurd to pander to a small group of Disney haters that don't understand the story and retheme such a nostalgic ride. Modifying Splash Mountain will not change history and will only encourage the easily offended to continue making desperate attempts at finding offense in additional attractions. Now, that is from the description of the petition itself, and I've also perused the comment section a bit, which is really something. Um, so I'll just share one piece of feedback that I think really captures the overall perspective. So one commenter wrote, quote, Sick of this whole offended PC crap. There is nothing racist or offensive about this attraction. Now, what I'd like to do as I wrap up here is tell you that um, a lot of the research that I've just shared with you here is um, a result of Enchanted Archives, which is a digital public history platform I developed in 2017 that is really supposed to introduce guests at the park to the historical roots of the food and aesthetics and attractions that they're taking in at Disney. So as you'll see from this slide here, while waiting in line for rides or walking around the parks, users can access our location-enabled mobile-friendly maps to learn more about their surroundings. Now, the idea here is that you can actually see your own little dot on that map if you enable location access, and you can bring up content near where you are standing. So if you were in line for Splash Mountain, for example, you would see the little bunny rabbit 
icon next to you and you'd say, oh, okay, so this is relevant to Splash Mountain. Let's read more about the history of the Brer Critters, which I shared with you here today. Now, other topics on the site include the real pirates of the Caribbean, as well as the LGBTQ authors behind beloved Disney films like The Little Mermaid and Mary Poppins, and also the history of the actual Matterhorn Mountain in Switzerland, which um, some people who I've discussed this with are shocked that um, there is a real one and, and just assume that uh, the Disney version just they called it the Matterhorn. So uh, the site has two digital maps, which I describe as libraries. One is going to be for Disneyland and one is going to be for the Magic Kingdom in Walt Disney World. Now, exciting additions to the site have been uh, the walking tour titled Walt Disney, A Life in Color, which uses 10 stops throughout Disneyland to tell the story of Walt's life and career. And my purpose there was really to break down this larger than life image that we have of Walt Disney and um, explore some of the major events in his life using the park to do that. There's also another walking tour titled The Dark History of Adventureland. And that uses seven stops in Disney World's Magic Kingdom to explore the history of European and American colonialism. And here I'd love to shout out my uh, my co-conspirator, Sarah Fling. So Sarah Fling was the author of the Adventureland Walking Tour, and she and I collaborated on it and it worked out really well, really like it. So, I mean, just to explain the origins of this, at one point I realized as a professional historian, I wasn't in a position to like run around Disneyland and put up interpretive plaques or wall labels like you'll see in the Palmer Museum exhibitions. So I thought, why not just create an online space that's able to do the same thing? So Enchanted Archives is really designed to, to offer a new layer of storytelling to the Disney park experience. And um, the, the kernel of this really is that Disneyland has untapped educational potential. Uh, and there is this audience just waiting. And we as skilled researchers and writers can really translate rigorous scholarship for a broad audience. So I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. And I look forward to any questions folks might have. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. I learned so much <laughs> and really enjoyed it too. Um, a lot of real aesthetic information that you brought in, I wasn't expecting, so that was great. So I just want to, I don't notice right now any questions in the Q&A or the chat, so I do encourage people to put questions in. If I might, I actually have a question for you. It might um, kind of, I don't know, take us a little bit off. So uh, your talk made me think about um, whether or not, or if you could explain whether or not the people's idea of Disney or the Disney experience um, has impacted popular concepts of American history. Um, just thinking about the tendency for people to think about, you know, the good old days, it kind of seems to be very much um, a Disneyfied good old days that they're talking about. And um, I mean, part of that is normal experience, right? With just kind of, you know, you remember things <laughs> maybe differently than reality. But do you feel that there's any impact on our consciousness uh, because of Disney? Uh, absolutely, Brandy, without a doubt. And I uh, would like to pick up on that term you use, Disney-fied, which um, at least in academic circles has really come to mean something that has been evacuated of its kind of authentic or real or factual information and really any educational potential and, and is instead about entertainment and distortion. And so um, I've read actual reviews of museum exhibits that accuse the exhibits of being Disney-fied because they use like too much technology or <laughs> don't really seem to be opting for entertainment over actual education. Now, um, absolutely, I would say um, Disney's version of the American West, westward expansion, for example, has really had a stranglehold on popular consciousness um, because you 
uh, really have, you know, the cowboys and native people struggle. Um, but uh, in interesting ways, too, you have this sense that that westward expansion was benevolent, uh, that it was, you know, strong and hardy pioneers who undertook that process. And um, it's really that 1950s kind of anti-communism lens that's going to shape that. This is when Davy Crockett was very successful. This is a, a Disney show um, that was put out and then Fess Parker, the star of that show, was used to open Frontierland uh, on that day in July of 1955 when the park was, uh, when visitors were invited to come in. And uh, in that sense, it really promotes this kind of rugged individualist version of frontier or westward expansion history uh, that it was was supposed to be held up in opposition to kind of communist or more communitarian models. Um, and, and all that is to say that historians have really unpacked how involved the federal government was in westward expansion, for example, by funding the railroad, by sending in armies to displace uh, Native people who live there. So definitely with the when it comes to the American West, um, but I think there are other examples of this too, but just for time, I'll just leave it at that, Brandy, thanks. All right, great, thank you. So questions coming in. Um, one person wanted to clarify whether the app Enchanted Archives is live, and if so, how has it been received um, overall? Maybe has Disney been involved with it at all? Thank you so much for that question. Um, and I'm just like thrilled that anyone would want to join us tonight to hear me talk about this. It's really like quite a pleasure. And um, I hope it came across that I'm very interested and excited in all these things. So uh, currently it just is a standalone website, enchantedarchives.com, which you can just hop on um, with any uh internet access. But um, what I'd like to do is, I, I shall manifest this, I want to just get some grant money to um, develop that app, that standalone app that people can download, because then the capabilities are really going to start expanding. You could include things like trivia, people could comment on the content so that um, as authors, we get a better understanding of this reception that the question includes. Um, for now, in terms of reception, I just have to rely on the messages I get on Instagram or the, the emails that I get from folks who are interested. And I would say the response is very positive. And, and that is, there's often skepticism about this. You know, are Disney park goers really interested in learning about slavery and Greek revival in the 19th century or when it comes to the Indiana Jones attraction and Adventureland? Are they really concerned about the real attempts by real Nazis to uh, undertake these archaeological digs to um, essentially win out in, in uh, World War II, but also justify their real kind of racist and genocidal activities? Um, and the answer is yes. I mean, I think there's, you know, these there's these cohorts of Disney Park attendees who are really eager to uh, not only just expand what they know about history because they're interested in it, but also there's this interesting competitiveness that I see emerge where people uh, want to know the most that they can about Disney. And uh, for folks who've been to the park over and over and over again, there's always a desire for a new experience. And I love the idea of being able to supply that in a way that is interesting, fun, engaging, um, and also maybe challenges some of the views that they hold about Walt Disney, about the parks. Um, and that's always just very exciting for me. Nice. Great. All, that question was from Kathleen Cahill. Thanks for your question, Kathleen. And she also wanted you to know that it was a great talk. So uh, another question from Mariah Mercado. I'm wanting to know if your research has included the history behind food and drinks sold in the parks. Thank you so much, Kathleen, for the question and the compliment. And Mariah, it's, it's great to hear from you. And um, I think food and drink is a great option for this because uh, there are so many fabulous historians working on that subject. One topic that I have taken on already is the global history of gumbo recipes. So um, one you know, intention that I have with the site is to really um, 
add new voices, more diverse experiences, perspectives that people are surprised are actually represented at the parks that they didn't know about or are not as familiar with. And so when it comes to gumbo, I mean, they're, basically that's an immigrant story um, intersecting with sort of enslaved populations, Caribbean influences, and I'm also a big hot sauce fan. So I got to work in a little bit of tobacco, or tobacco, oh my goodness, <laughs> Tabasco, Tabasco history there. Um, but to your point, Mariah, I think there's much more to be done. Uh, the, we feature rum history a little bit in that real Pirates of the Caribbean post. Um, but again, I, I would say Disney's always coming out with new food experiences at the parks. And so many of that is going to have rich and complex historical roots. Nice. Thank you. We have a couple of questions around Disney World in Florida. I'm going to combine them. One from Marianne Stankiewicz about whether or not the app is including Disney World or if you have plans for that, since it's closer for us on the East Coast. And then another from Carrie Mangelusa, who as a Floridian is interested in your thoughts um, about Disney World and even Epcot and their reinterpretation of history. And if it's different than the ways that that's done in Disneyland. Thank so you. That's both a lot. So Sorry. Much. No, that's <laughs> excellent. It's fabulous. And um, I moved to State College uh, not lot, that long ago, but basically 18 months ago. And before that, I was living in the American West. So I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona, then was living in Santa Barbara, California while I was in PhD school and then in Salt Lake City, Utah. And so Disneyland was sort of my home park. And I, I also love the sort of tension between Disneyland people and, and the Walt Disney World people. I think it's great. Um, and so actually, I have not been to Disney World in years and have sort of relied on other people who uh, affiliate more with Disney World, have are from the East and have spent more time there uh, to give me some sense of how we could build out the Disney World experience. And gosh, I'm sure if if um, any of you are familiar, there are just, it feels like lim limitless possibilities because Disney World has so many different parks. Um, and, and so right now there is a map that has a few entries for the Magic Kingdom at Disney World. And also the Dark History of Adventureland tour is of the Magic Kingdom in Disney World. So there are, it's it's sort of growing slowly. Um, but I think when it comes to like American Revolutionary War history, colonial history, I mean there's there's more of a representation of that at Disney World at the Magic Kingdom. And I think that is great. Um, but I also have uh some folks who are who I met through sort of Disney Instagram groups uh who are also scholars and who are scientists and and they say, well, you know, there's huge educational potential at a place like Epcot. Uh and I and I'm so excited by that. And I, I because I, I love the idea that this website would feature, and then, and then ultimately the app that I would like to develop would feature all varieties of expertise, right? And again, sort of cross over that Disney threshold in a way um, that says, look, like this is a very accessible audience. Sometimes they are literally a captive audience because they are waiting for 45 minutes to board Peter Pan's adventure or whatever. <laughs> uh, I just think, you know, what a great way to engage them and to add some complexity to what they're looking at. Nice. Very nice. Thank you. All right. Some final comment and question uh, from Joyce Robinson saying, loved your talk. She grew up uh, going to Disney World when it first opened, but wondering if you have any thoughts on the Disneyfication of Broadway. I would say, Joyce, thanks for that um, tough one. I like it. Um, I teach U.S. history uh, here at Penn State. I teach the first half of the survey, part one, if you will. And uh, one of the units we cover is the American Revolution. And um, I promise I will get to the point here. A lot of students come in what we might say is, is like the Hamilton version of the Revolutionary War and the experience and the debates that were underway um, in during the founding of the nation among the quote unquote founding fathers, right? And there's some good writing on this, um, and I and I won't claim to be you know a, a real expert, um, but I think that there are concerns among people about what 
how Disney and, and how their very elaborate shows have then kind of seeped out to affect other places of entertainment or education, um, including Broadway. And, and I'm glad you're bringing this to my attention, Joyce, because I think that's a really interesting angle. Um, and I, I think that probably people are upset about it because uh, they feel like maybe things like the acting are being underplayed or the singing to just have like, I don't know, fireworks going off or something. Um, but I'm hoping that there are also points of reconciliation the same way that there are between Disney and historians. I'll share just one anecdote. Disney has helped advise Smithsonian exhibit designers on how they're going to mount exhibits. That was true at the National Museum of the American Indian, for example. And I and I heard a great panel presentation about it once. And, and so there are ways that there can be this collaborative effort where Disney is sort of investing in a sincere way in educational institutions. Maybe there's some way that that could happen uh, on Broadway that feels sort of productive and not like it's alienating uh, its, its fans. <laughs> Nice. Great. Thank you so much for covering those questions, some additional interesting um, ideas that we got through that. So it was a wonderful talk. Thank you so much, um, including the themes from the exhibition from the very beginning and then really illuminating that interplay, right, between um, making history and, um, right, no, just how our individual selves make history, including Disney. So really appreciate it. It was lively and I thank you so much. Thank you everybody for attending and um, we're off. So have a good night, everybody.